May I please invite the speakers, Kunkawi, uh, 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 Ms. Gwen Robinson, uh, Mr. Nyanta Molem, and um, Ms. Tinle Win. Um, let us begin with, uh, well first, welcome, good morning to everyone. Uh, it's late November, or is it mid-November, but it feels like it's still April, a bit, bit warm, but this room is cool enough. Today we have uh, a public forum on post-election Myanmar, and we're looking at three dimensions uh, that are interactive. Uh, what's going to happen to the government, uh, the, what's going to be the role of the military now after the elections, and then uh, the role of the minorities, minority groups that, um, that have, didn't do so well in the election. So before we begin, to, um, let me invite uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Political Science, uh, Professor Ek Tang uh, Sabatana, to open uh, the forum. Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning to all of you and welcome to this morning's uh, public forum on post-election Myanmar, organized by ISIS Thailand. It is truly my pleasure to introduce this forum because Myanmar just have a momentous and remarkable election on November 8th. It is incredible that the election was smooth, free and fair, more or less. Who would have thought that it would be go so well? The results, of course, were overwhelming in favor of the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi. The NLD's win was not a surprise, but I think uh, many of us were still cut off guard by NLD's victory margin. The party won about 82% of the vote and is now forced to form one party government. Or perhaps not. Perhaps Ms. Suji will strike a compromise and form some kind of a coalition government with the military that includes the ethnic minorities who make up around half of the population. That is what we are here to hear about this morning. How do we explain the election outcomes? Why was the NLD's winning margin so huge? Why were the ethnic parties more or less decimated? What will happen next now that Aung San Suu Kyi can pretty much call the shots in Myanmar's future. These are some of the questions that are brushed uh, this morning. It is my pleasure to open this forum today, and I thank everyone for being here. In particular, let me show the gratitude to our speaker. First, Mr. Nentan Marin, uh, Managing Director of Virind partner uh, Myanmar office. Uh, Ms. Tian Lai Wind, uh, chief correspondent Myanmar now. Uh, Mr. Jonathan Head, Southeast Asia correspondent uh, BBC News. Uh, Ms. Gwen <coughs> Robinson, our senior fellow ISIS Thailand and chief editor of the Nikkei ASEAN Review. Uh, Mr. Kavi Jongkit Tawon, senior fellow ISIS Thailand and also a columnist of the nation uh, newspaper. I would add that our first two speakers are young and bright Myanmar nationals who are speaking here for the first time. We are eager to hear from them. In addition, we will hear from a veteran journalist about how this election transpired and what it means for Myanmar's incumbent government, ASEAN and Thailand. Uh, thanks very much 
again for joining us. And now, uh, may I return the floor to uh, Professor Titinan. We are informal here, so uh, it, it's flexible and uh, uh, we want to be at ease. Uh, I think there's some media in the room, that's fine. Uh, we have five speakers. Uh, this is a long lineup for us. Normally we have four, but five. Uh, the speakers can speak for 15 to 20 minutes each, and then we'll have some discussion. Uh, you know, it's, it's my pleasure, really, today to uh, introduce the first two speakers. Uh, Nienta Molin is uh, a young man I've been in touch with uh, for some years now. When I get uh, depressed or distressed about the future of Myanmar or even Thailand, uh, I think about him and I think, you know, he's the future of Myanmar, so he's, um, he'll, he'll lead off. Uh, and then followed by um, Din Lewin, whom I've met for the first time here today, but I've been very impressed with all the things that she's been saying. Uh, Nianta is a MD, Managing Director, Managing Partner, I think, with uh, Reins and Partners. Reins and Partners is a leading consultancy uh, based in Southeast Asia, but covering uh, Myanmar. It's one of the leading uh, consultancy platforms uh, in Myanmar. And then uh, Ms. Din Le Wind, uh, she runs Myanmar Now. She has been a reporter, a journalist with Reuters in the past and also has worked with the Reuters Foundation. So they will lead off and you have their bios, the full details uh, with you. Uh, so for them, they will tell us a little bit about you know, how did we get this, uh, these election results so overwhelming uh, and, uh, and then what we might expect uh, in the next few months uh, going forward. So Nianta, could you kick us off? 15 to 20 minutes. Hi, can you hear me? Good. Um, so yes, we've had a, I think it, it's not too much to say, an incredible uh, sort of climate in Myanmar over the past uh, month or so. Um, for many of the people in the country, including myself, um, and I think also with Ben, um, you know, this is historic. Um, it was the first time vote for me. And in the lead up to the elections, I think there was some, there was quite a bit of thinking that was floating about what the, the outcome might be. But uh, I think it's not unfair to say we've all been a bit floored by uh, the results as, as they've uh, come out. I want to touch on a few things. This was an incredible election on, on a number of different levels. For one, we saw probably an, uh, an unexpected level of turnout by voters um, in Myanmar, somewhere around 70% if I, uh, if I remember. Um, and it, it just went to show the extent to which, uh, you know, despite the concerns, despite the, many of the, the initial uh, criticism and uh, worries that the public held that the that analysts and observers were were were, were discussing. Um, people still came out to vote on that day, and you listen to the people and you talk to people who who were out. And for many, it for one, it was you know being uh, a first time event in itself. For others, I think many felt quite enabled by the presence, by the international attention, um, by the presence of observers. Um, and quite emboldened to come out that day to uh, to make their uh, to make their voices heard. Um, why did the NLD do so well? And I think that's been the question that that we've all been uh, spending some time thinking about. You know, many much weight was given to the rise of new uh, loci of power. You know, the, the the independent parties that have been set up um, uh, quite apart from the NLD. Um, the ethnic vote, uh, much was made of that as well in the lead up. But the results that, that have come out uh, that we've seen uh, very much firmly put those, uh, uh, you know, th those initial uh, thinking uh, to rest. Um, for one, I, I, I think I'd, I'd like to highlight a few things. The NLD essentially took up very early on uh, a very simple but effective campaign strategy. That's what I see, right? Um, for uh, the focus on Aung San Suu Kyi as the leader of the party, as the founder or co-founder of the party, um, relying on her personal charisma to to drive the the appeal of the party and the voters at the uh, and the the candidates at the township and uh, district level 
um, this played a huge part, I think, in, in uh, essentially tailoring uh, a very effective message of, of change, of something different from uh, what, you know, what Myanmar has been under for the past uh, few decades. The, the focus on the logo, given that for many people, this was a, a first time election, you know, the day of your vote, you're, you're, you're in the polling station, you're faced with a long list of uh, names and, 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 and different flags. It was, I think, a, an incredibly effective approach to, to get that NLD flag uh, driven in over and over again, that this is what you want to be looking for, this is what you want to be looking for. And tie that to essentially, uh, I'd say, a, a, a fairly neutral voter education uh, strategy you know, taking people, taking uh, the constituents through the process of voting early on um, helped the NLD immensely. But you also have to, to wonder why, you know, at the same time, you know, the, the, so much was made about the, the other parties, and especially, again, the, the ethnic parties in their particular states. A couple of parties did well, right? We've seen the Rakhine, um, notwithstanding their, how their chairman uh, did himself, we, we've seen the Rakhine Party do well. We've seen um, the Shan uh, fare a little bit better than most. But overall, I mean, uh, the, this, I think there were some misconceptions about the ethnic vote and the, let's say, you know, this whole idea of, of uh, swing voters in Myanmar was a little bit uh, premature. I don't think that's where the politics of Myanmar is at, is yet, right? The, the politics in Myanmar is still, the, essentially when you think about it, it's uh, one way to characterize it is a vote for change, but it's also a protest vote. And I think part of the reason why we put so much weight on the other parties was in part because you know, people look to 2010 when the SNDP did well, you know, when the, the RNDP and the, you know, a couple of other different parties around the country did manage to capture quite a, quite a number of seats, uh, the NDF, for example. In retrospect, the, you know, those parties did well in, in, a, in a particular kind of vacuum, right? Where in 2010, the NLD boycotted the election. Um, it enabled some of these smaller parties to, to take up seats. A very different environment, a very different context from what happened in November with the NLD, and actually the, the few months leading up to November, I'd say even since the, the start of the year. Um, the NLD's campaign uh, very much was uh, already in motion, I'd say, um, in the early months of 2015. The other thing that I think that also, that also gets missed is the election commission. The election commission does not get enough credit sometimes, I think. There were a lot of concerns about the impartiality of, of the chairman and uh, the election commission, um, given some, you know, pretty stubborn comments he'd made in the past to, to media. But you have to give it to them for essentially pulling off, for running uh, what ended up being quite an objective, quite a, you know, despite the different you know, challenges around the voter list, this despite the issues around, uh, I think there's some lingering issues around advanced voting. Overall, given the context, given this was, I would say, the first real nationwide vote um, that approximates uh, a fair election uh, and almost a free election. Uh, it was quite well run. Should I go into next? Or you want to? So we 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 you know have put some thinking into in terms of what we can look forward to in the the coming year. You're not going to see these new MPLX step in until early February, or let's see, you know, formally at the end of end of January. Um, from there, they will elect, you know, the, the speakers of the two houses, and then there will be the appointment of the next president, who then picks his cabinet to step in by the end of March. That process is is, is constitutionally laid out. It's it's I think quite well covered. What's going to be interesting is actually also the next couple of months leading up to, to early February. And we are going to have to look to a couple of critical events. 
for one, tomorrow, we've been waiting for this uh, for a while now with some uh, trepidation, both the Commander-in-Chief and the President have agreed to meet with Aung San Suu Kyi, and I, both those meetings are taking place Wednesday, that's tomorrow. Um, those meetings will be critical. The meeting with the, the Commander-in-Chief in particular would be critical. Um, the meeting with the President, the outgoing President, will be a bit of a formality, will be a bit of uh, some face-saving, will be maybe a bit around how to ensure there is a smooth transition and handover of portfolios from this current incumbent government to the next, um, even though Aung San Suu Kyi is not going to be present. Um, the meeting with the Commander-in-Chief would be more interesting given the stake that the military has in the process. I think it's quite clear that we're not going to see constitutional change in Myanmar um, in the next few months. Definitely not in time to allow uh, Aung San Suu Kyi to be a president under the current system. I don't think Aung San Suu Kyi is going to push on that issue either in the meeting tomorrow. It is a desirable, it's been the focus of the NLD for the past year and a half. Um, but given what they have now, I do believe she will take a bit more of a conciliatory approach. That's in essence, I think, the message that's been communicated between intermediaries, uh, uh, through intermediaries between Aung San Suu Kyi and the Commander in Chief. I think the focus will be very much around how to ensure that Myanmar moves forward with what will essentially be almost two parallel administrations. You will have the NLD elected government with whoever is on top um, of cabinet that will control foreign policy, economic policy, um, the legislature. But at the same time, you have an independent commander in chief in charge of a number of critical portfolios, including, of course, defense and security, both internal and external, which is uh, critical for Myanmar. Uh, but also with the, the very backbone, uh, the administrative backbone of government in Myanmar. For example, you know, home affairs as a ministry is, uh, in, in my time, I think consulting is one, one of those ministries that has been particularly difficult to, to pierce through. And for good reason. They, they essentially, their arm reaches all the way down to the, the township level and is very much the the driving force in, from, from local government upwards. These two centers of power will have to coexist. Um, and this will be not an easy process, not a, not a smooth process, but we're, 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 we're in a position where, uh, you know, given, depending on how the meeting tomorrow goes, I think uh, we should see some uh, interesting uh, outcomes. What will the in, in terms of policy, what could it mean with the NLD in charge? The message, I think, is quite promising. And it's, we have an, quite an optimistic outlook. For one, she called a, a meeting of the newly elected MPs over the weekend. Um, and the internal message is very clear. Uh, the NLD will take a very strong and uh, I think strict approach in terms of funding business, in terms of how uh, the MP elects conduct themselves, either as members of the legislature or as members of the future cabinet. Aung San Suu Kyi will likely, you know, will have to actually draw from uh, current members of government um, as well as people outside her party. I think she's made clear that she does not intend to see the new MP elects transition into ministerial or, or cabinet roles. Quite rightly so. I think uh, the search has already started um, in terms of trying to figure out, trying to identify future members of an Emily uh, elected cabinet. Um, in terms of their policy outlook, I think there's a lot of catching up to do. Um, the two years, maybe three, since the NLD or members of the NLD joined the legislature um, under the 2012 by-election, I think have been useful. And there is some institutional memory there, um, some experience there. To what extent they can transfer it in time to the rest of the, you know, some of these MPs are, this is 
probably the first time for, for you know, many of them come from quite varied backgrounds. And stepping into the role of policymaker will be uh, a little bit jarring. It will be, there will be some uh, pickup time. I don't think it's going to happen uh, quickly at all. But that's not to say it wouldn't happen. Um, I, I, don't, I don't quite see yet signs of a, a potential stall. I think with that, I want to maybe hand over to Titan. OK, thank you very much, uh, Nyanta. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, look, uh, you know, it's a, it's a moving, developing story post-election. So we, we are still, I think, internalizing the results and, and trying to uh, project some of the mechanics that will be in place uh, going forward. So uh, the four things that you mentioned for the election victory, the election results, you know, the brand really sold, right? ASS, ASSK, Aung San Suu Kyi, and NLD, the, um, the by-elections in 2010 were misleading. It misled, you know, if we had a bet on the election results, a lot of people would have lost it. They would have said NLD would win, but they would have said that ethnic parties would do well, you know, would do pretty well, USDP would have got a little bit more, but uh, in fact, NLD swept, uh, except for Arakan and uh, the Shan party. So uh, apart from that, voter education helped, and then um, the role of the, uh, the Union Election Commission, which was really um, more effective than we thought. Was one thing, we haven't seen the, vote, the voter breakdown actually. So one of the interesting, Myanmar has a first past the post system. So that's not to say there wasn't support. We, we don't quite have an idea how much that support is. But because of the first past the post system, uh, you know, all it took was a simple majority at the constituency level uh, to enable the, the NLD to capture okay. most of the seats. So, Thank you. Um, what you describe also now in the post-election uh, arrangement, home affairs, defense, right, under the military, it, it reminds me of the Thai semi-democracy in the 1980s when finance, interior, and defense were under an unelected prime minister supported by the army, General Prem. And there was a kind of a compromise that worked for eight years, eight years of semi-democracy in Thailand. Um, so I think we could be seeing some kind of a, you know, semi-democratic, not fully democratic as such uh, arrangement. Um, Dean Lewin, can you tell us a little bit more, expanding on some of the points already mentioned by Nianta? In particular, you know, we have to read Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, as much as we, she's been admired, she has the courage, she's suffered, suffered so much in the last 25 years. Uh, you know, this is Myanmar in her, in her hands now. What will she do with it? Uh, does she know how to lead from behind? That's my question. Does she know how to lead from behind? And would she be willing to do it? Oh, gosh, um, that's the million dollar question that we all want to know, right? And I think um, at this point in time, all of us, if we try and answer that, it'd just be purely speculating. We haven't really had an experience of, of her actually leading. We've always seen her as this human rights icon, this demo you know, democracy leader. Um, and I think in some ways, being in opposition, it's a lot easier than being in government, I think, as we all know. I mean, I just want to start out a little bit. Nyanta spoke very um, eloquently about the general um, view and you know, how did this uh, win come about for NLT and for, 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 for Aung San Suu Kyi to have now be you know, so close to this power, um, to, 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 to being in, able to form a government, you know, something that she's been um, obviously fighting for for the past few decades. Um, I want to start with a little bit of a personal experience and also give you a sense of how this NLD landslide could have come about. Um, like Nyantha, this was, I was a first time voter um, at the grand old age of 38. You know, I was too young in 1990, but I was old enough to remember um, the, the feeling of the excitement, um, the acceleration, you know, that, that, that we are on the cusp of change, that this was it. Only took about 25 more years um, for this to happen again, but it was, it was a similar feeling, you know, I, I remember um, waking up um, early because I had to go to work. Obviously, it's an important day for journalists, but I wanted to vote on that day itself as a first-time voter. Um, took about five or ten minutes to the polling station um, at my local area, and you know, I got there, and there was already more than a hundred people queuing, and this was 20 minutes before polling opened at six o'clock. So this was 5:40 in the morning over 100 people already queuing. The couple at the front of the queue in my polling station said they've been waiting since 3.30 in the morning. Yeah, it was a small uh, school compound and there were five polling stations. My polling station alone had 1,300 voters. So you can imagine it was thousands of people in that one little small compound. And 
uh, it's a school, you know, high school compound, and there is only a small concrete pathway separating you uh, from safety and the stagnant water in the grains drains next door. Um, but, you know, it was crowded, people were slightly shoving and jostling, but everybody was jovial, in very good mood, um, very helpful. You know, one of my great aunts, um, she was 84, came along with us because she said she didn't believe in the advanced voting. She didn't think if she voted in advance, her vote was going to count. So she wanted to be there on that day to vote. There were lots of other people who were in the 70s and 80s voting. And this community spirit that we talked about all the time in Myanmar, that I felt had either been lost or suppressed after years of you know, not being able to trust each other. I, I, I saw that that day, you know, everybody, the elderly, you know, they were given shades, seats, looked after, there was no problem. It was an hour and a half long queue that took me to actually vote and come out. It was a complicated process because you have to vote for three people. At least every everybody has to vote uh, three times, yeah, for your uh, lower house MP, your upper house MP, and your state and region MP. And if you're an ethnic, you know, person, then you also have to vote for an ethnic affairs minister. So it's quite a complicated process where you have to queue every single time to get a ballot paper and then you have to chop it, you know. And, and so it was a long process and not everybody knew that they were actually going to be voting for three people. You know, so there were people who were taking it upon themselves to educate while we were queuing. Um, every time somebody come out and said they finished voting, you know, there was this sh shout of victory or like, did you succeed? You know, I had a friend from abroad who wanted to see what the fuss was all about and came along to the voting station to take pictures. And I was like, oh no, I'm not sure whether you should do it because people might be, you know, uh, um, not really like, you know, a foreigner being there to, to, to witness this momentous event. But actually, they absolutely loved it. They thought having a foreigner's presence was somehow going to make the elections more transparent, having that eye of somebody abroad was almost a validation of what was going on. Um, and people would just come up to him and proudly show their pinkies where you've been marked with indelible ink to say you voted. You know, one of whom was apparently this old gentleman who was, came on a walking stick and spoke to him in English to say, it's never too late. I think that scene, what happened was that scene was repeated across the country in many polling stations. Um, there's all these talk about, you know, the blind fate towards the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi. And yes, it is true. There are a lot of people where, you know, you cannot even criticize the NLD or Dorsu. And, we, you know, it's almost like a sacrilege, which obviously is wrong because you should be able to criticize anybody. But having said that, you know, from the interviews that we've done, you know, the many people that we've spoken to, what we've also found was that people made a calculated decision. It was a strategic decision that they made to vote for the NLD. And it wasn't just even that NLD campaigners, you know, NLD had a very good grassroots campaign, like Nyanda said, you know, they had a simple message, you know, the lady at the center, uh, vote for change. But also what I've, you know, what we've discovered in, uh, with our interviews and, you know, talking to people was that there were actually all these unofficial grassroots, you know, NLD campaigners who are not NLD members. They're not affiliated with NLD in any way, but they thought this was the time for change. You know, I was talking to uh, this uh, uh, former university teacher the other day. Um, so, she, you know, she used to work for the government um, and she was voting in the constituency where there was an independent MP called Don Yun Thin, who was actually very, you know, well respected. She was running for the lower house seat. And this university lecturer was telling me how she actually went door to door to her neighbors um, before the elections, trying to talk to them, you know, just on the pretext of asking for their, after, asking after their health, and then to tell them you should vote for NLD. And, you know, everybody's like, oh yeah, but, but Donya Nyo Thin, she's good, she's got a track record in the, you know, Yangon region parliament. She's like, no, her alone cannot do anything. We need a landslide. So I've spoken to lots of other former government officials, once again, no affiliations with NLD, who seem to have taken it upon themselves to educate people, voters, friends, relatives, neighbors within their communities um, to get that message, not necessarily because they all believe in NLD or Don Aung San Suu Kyi, but it was almost as a protest vote, almost as a way to tell the military establishment 
that this is this is it. We don't want to accept it. And, and, and some because they think this is the only other valid choice outside of USDP that we currently have. There are lots of other parties, you know, ethnic parties and small parties, you know, the NDFs, the new NDP, um, and yet everybody thought what needed was for a strong result. Part of it was because some of the USDP MPs in the run-up to the elections were talking about how, you know, they only needed 26% because the military bloc already had 25%. And so combining them would be 51%. Now those kind of uh, talks and speeches seem to have actually worried a lot of ordinary voters. And that made them decide that, you know what, we're not gonna try and do the vote splitting. We're not gonna try and vote other parties. We're gonna vote for one party to ensure that there is, you know, an outright winner. And that seemed to have been the case with ethnic minorities as well, you know, uh, based on our conversations with analysts and ethnic minority voters, they thought the structural change that they would like would probably come in from a big national party rather than a small ethnic party who might not necessarily have a big say in the national parliament. The NLD is largely seen as a Burman party, you know, they didn't field any Muslim candidates at all, you know, it, despite that, actually, a lot of the ethnic minorities voters that we've spoken to said they chose the NLD and it was a calculated choice that they make. Um, so what does this mean? You know, now that NLD's got a landslide, you know, they needed 329 seats to form a government to, to get the 51% uh, in the parliament. They currently have 390, 390. So that's way more than what they need. Even if a few have a few are disqualified, as I think is expected after all the complaints procedure and all that stuff, they would still have enough to be able to form a government. Obviously, you can never predict with certainty what's gonna happen in Myanmar, but let's just work with what we have, which is that NLD will form a government. But like Nyanta said, you know, um, they have been making all the right noises. She spoke to the MPs to say, don't, don't expect ministerial positions. Yeah, she also been publicly um, speaking for a few times about how she wants her government to be a national reconciliation government, which everybody took it to mean that it would be inclusive of ethnic representatives as well as possibly USDP. Now it seemed that she also reassured uh, the diplomatic community when she met them the week before last that she understands the importance of continuity in key sectors which many also took it to mean that some of the current key people in you know, things like finance and economic positions will, will stay. It's, it's, it's a smart move because number one, you know, it, it, the whole idea of inclusive national reconciliation um, will probably go towards uh, reassuring the military and the powers that be that she is not out for revenge. She is you know, willing to work together but also it will reduce the risk of triggering a by-election um, if she chose from her crop of MPs to be part of the cabinet. And I'm not really sure even the NLD is willing to have a by-election, have, have another you know, elections and, 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 and compete with the USDP and other parties again. But what about the minorities then? You know, we kept talking about, I was one of those uh, people as well in the run-up to the elections talking about the fact that, look, in the 1990, you know, there was only SNLD. Now we have not just SNLD and SNDP, but we have the Balos, we have the Balans, we have the Akka, we have all these different ethnic parties. But what, what does it mean for them now? Because a huge majority of them, they got steamrolled just by the NLD machine. And it is, it is worrying that in a lot of the states, there will be one very dominant party only, except for in, in Rakhine and Shan, because NLD swept everything. Um, so despite the fact that, you know, that even the ethnic voters made a calculated choice, um, there are still questions remaining as to how it will work on the state and region level, especially in ethnic areas. Um, there's also the question of the ceasefire process, um, signing, you know, the political dialogue starting, some of it has already started, how is that going to be continued by the NLD, you know, will it be continued by the NLD? Um, there's all these things to untangle, um, but I want to 
you know, my last part, I want to focus actually on one part of the minorities, um, which is or, or at least another M word, you know, so the minorities, the Muslims, the Rohingya, but also another M word, which is very important, is the Mabatha, you know, the, 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 the Patriotic Association of Myanmar, or the radical Buddhist monks. Um, what, where does this election leave us? Because they were very openly campaigning for USDP in the run-up to the elections. You know, they started with just more, you know, uh, talking more about, oh, we need to, uh, support people who protect our race and religion. And then they went on from there to actually being openly campaigning for USDP. They cited the fact that there's st stability with the USDP. They cited the fact that USDP and military are too close and that if USDP does not win again, the military might not necessarily um, take that very kindly. They, uh, and they also pointed out to the fact that there was these very controversial race and religion protection bills. There's four bills that restricts interfaith marriage between Buddhist women and other men. There is a bill that um, outlaws polygamy or you know, makes it uh, a crime uh, 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 for some, somebody who's already married to be in another relationship. There is a law to restrict the frequency of childbirth um, for women from certain backgrounds. Um, and there's, what's the other one? There were four, four bills. So, you know, the swift passage of those bills. Those bills were actually lobbied by, by, my, by, by the Mabatha, essentially. And they very swiftly, within a couple of years, passed. You know, there's been a bill that's been languishing in the parliament on violence against women bill, yet that still hasn't gone anywhere. So they used that as an excuse to campaign for the USDP. But I think the results, I think you have to take it, um, the results in a way repudiate everything, you know, that, 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 that the Mabatha has been saying in the sense of, you know, they just, that all those nationalism and that hate speech was dismissed with a ballot. You can say that, and I think it is fair to say that people decided that, look, this is not what we're going to accept. But I think there are also other things to think about. Number one, like Nyanda said, we haven't seen a breakdown of votes. So we don't know to what extent, what kind of support those nationalistic parties and USDP and the people that the Mabatha has supported, you know, how much vote do they get? We don't know. Maybe it was a close call, but because it was the first past the post, the NLD won. Number two, Mabatha is in it for the long game. Yeah, the elections are just an event to them. Um, they were shocked by the scale of NLD win, um, and I think they were shocked also by the fact that what is considered a very largely Buddhist country seemed to have not listened to what monks were saying. But if you look at it, you know, they've cautiously welcomed the NLD win, but in interviews with people including us, they have said that, look, the NLD cannot touch the race and religion bills, they cannot touch the 1982 citizenship law then it will be okay, you know? So there's still a force there. I don't think that movement is going to go away. And NLD, the new government, everybody will have to learn to see how they are going to work with this nationalism. Um, you know, just last week, um, we did a couple of stories on these men that were detained um, and then later jailed for publishing a Rohingya calendar. Um, so. Over the weekend, on a Sunday, uh, a group of nationalists, um, nationalists, including some Mabatha monks, met up and talked about this uh, calendar that said that the Rohingya was, uh, a, a, you know, it was an ethnic group, and cited some of the uh, former political leaders, including the former prime minister U Nu, citing that you know Rohingya did exist, um, and that was spreading on social media. So these people had a meeting to discuss about what to do with this calendar, and they came with a you know, way with the decision that they are going to try and file charges against the people who publish it. On the Monday, we called uh, Upa Malka, who is one of the leading Mabatha monks, and he said, you know what, we're not gonna charge, uh, we'll file charges anymore because the police are going ahead. We don't have to do it. So we followed up the story, went to the police station, went to the court, and essentially those guys, um, so there were five people, including the publisher, uh, but not the guy who commissioned the calendar who's on the run. So they detained them and then fined them 10 million charts. 
um, under the Printing and Publishing Act to 2014, you know, for publishing things that uh, is supposed to create discord and you know things like that. So they paid the fine and left, went home on the Monday evening. On Tuesday morning, they were rearrested under a much more serious charge, Section 505B, which actually carries a jail term, and they were sent straight to prison. We spoke to the police officers and they said, well, the orders came from above. You know, they wouldn't say more than that. What does this mean? It means that the issue of Rohingya continues to be extremely controversial. Nationalist groups will continue to use that as a lightning rod and a way to check the NLD. Yeah, keep, keep the NLD in check. Um, and the fact that the Mabatha, <coughs> despite the election results, still hold some sway, you know, they didn't, we asked the Mabatha, or at least the Mabatha monk, uh, Ubamaka, uh, did you pressure the authorities to take the action? He wouldn't say, but he did say that the fine, the monetary fine alone was utterly inadequate. And with those cheerful thoughts, I think I'll give you back to Okay, thank you very much. Uh... <laughs> I mean, the, the, the contours of your remarks, I think, uh, first I would, I would say that the benchmark that we could be looking at uh, in the weeks going forward uh, is how inclusive the NLD-led Aung San Suu Kyi picked uh, government uh, will end up being more, more or less, right? So if it's very inclusive, then it's a good sign. She has I mentioned national reconciliation as a guiding principle, so we will see if that's uh, applied in, in, in reality, in action. And then, uh, you know, the problems and challenges we've seen, they have been uh, silenced by the election results, uh, nationalism, for example, and minority grievances and so on, but they have not gone away. So I think expectations are very high. Expectations are very high. Uh, and if these expectations are not fulfilled in, in good order, in short, fairly short order too, I think some results will have to be shown. The old problems could recur and resurface again about nationalism, uh, you know, minority grievances and uh, even the, 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 uh, the ethnic wars. So now we come to um, uh, two veteran journalists. Uh, first is uh, Gwen Robinson, who is the chief editor of the Nikkei Asian Review. She has been uh, uh, spending most, much of her time, almost most of her time really, in Myanmar over the last uh, a couple of years, few years. Um, she's a senior fellow uh, with ISIS Thailand uh, when she's in Bangkok. Uh, but she travels widely. She covered the elections uh, on November 8th, uh, was there. So she also has interviewed uh, President Deng Seng uh, and has talked to his uh, circle and, and so on. So I mean, we might hear from you, Gwen, among other remarks about uh, you know, where does uh, this all leave Deng Seng, uh, the incumbent government, USDP, and you know, what do they expect? How do they see this election results? Thanks, Jenny. I, I think this is a, a very relevant uh, question because I think there's a tendency now in the euphoria to see the old USDP ruling party system, you know, the old president, uh, the cabinet, as a kind of spent force uh, that's kind of destroyed. But in fact, uh, obviously, what we've got now happening is a, a new configuration emerging, which will not become clear for, for months, um, uh, for months uh, from now. Um, so first, perhaps, um, I mean, both Jonathan and I and uh, Thin and to a small extent Kawi were um, there for the elections and, and looking at it on the ground and reporting it. There's lots of insights from that period, but maybe most usefully um, uh, those that relate to what we're going to see going forward. Um, and anyone who can guarantee that they know what's going to happen is completely lying. So these are all just... Uh, uh, observations. I think first what's really clear is the absolute stunned disbelief amongst ruling party and uh, to a lesser extent military uh, which doesn't sort of give much away um, publicly. But uh, uh, there were earlier suggestions I think well before the election of um, internal polling in the USDP and a couple of newspapers got hold of um, uh, leaked, what they claim were leaked uh, documents uh, about uh, those internal polls that showed the worst case scenario could be 5%, which is just about what the USDP actually ended up 
uh, getting, but it was so far beyond anyone's comprehension that the party could completely collapse that I think what happened is that nobody expected it. Um, there was no plan Z. There were plan A, B and, and C's where they got this much, they got a bit less, they got a bit less, but there was no planning for a complete rout. Uh, so they're not actually prepared to be cast into the wilderness and that's a challenge for them. Um, but also, as I'll go into later, I think that's a real advantage for reform-minded, and there are some reform-minded people in the old ruling establishment, including, to be fair, the president himself, um, who did forge ahead with quite an impressive set of reforms in the last five years. He's surrounded by a coterie of ministers and support staff, um, on all sectors, including particularly economic fronts, um, also the peace process with his minister who was involved with that, and uh, various other sectors. These are people who are not just going to fade into the woodwork. Some of them will, but I think out of this, what we're going to see is possibly a new party or a revamped USDP that loses a lot of the old Deadwood, who are only there to make money and enjoy being in power anyway and it is not attractive for them to be in a kind of minor, disgraced, um, humiliated, defeated ruling party. They'll go off and make money and try and work their way through the system. So I wouldn't discount the possibility of a kind of third way party of kind of slightly conservative uh, or right of centre reformers. Um, so um, that's uh, one, uh, one key factor. What next? Well, as Nyanta mentioned, you've got uh, Aung San Suu Kyi finally getting her much uh, asked for meeting with the Commander in Chief, Min Aung Lai, and the President tomorrow, which, you know, typically in Myanmar, I mean, two weeks ago we were all told that they weren't going to meet her until all election disputes were resolved, which could be another year. Um, but in fact, clearly common sense has prevailed, and uh, that meeting will. I mean, in some ways it will be historic, as um, I think uh, Nyanta Othin mentioned. Uh, it could be largely ceremonial with the president, uh, who's just going to maybe say some nice words and hand over, but, um, I mean, discuss the handover. But uh, with the commander in chief, it's a fairly critical meeting, and I think it will kick off the horse trading that will actually set the parameters of this new configuration, whatever it may be. and. Um, on, uh, you know, definitely something's got to give. We've, there's so many variables, including, you know, whether she, whether Aung San Suu Kyi can do some kind of deal with the military to compromise, to even support some kind of reforms. I agree with Nyanta, there is no way I think the constitution can be changed to enable her to actually become president before all this takes place and she, her government's due to come in uh, on uh, April the 1st, I believe. But, you know, certain things could be set in train and we will see some of the outlines, for example, of her role. And that is a very critical question, also which I'll, I'll go into um, in a minute. But I'd say the, the beginning of this horse, ra horse trading will set this emerging new political order on one level. Um, and overall, I think what's important to, to um, realise that, in fact, I mean, what we're seeing emerge is, a, a, I think one blogger called it an elected autocracy or uh, a kind of one-party democracy, um, which actually, I mean, it's almost, it's, it's very ironic that the great um, display of democracy ends up giving one single party and a particular figure control over the entire parliament, really, apart from this 25%, but really fairly full control and uh, the government. So she will be the power to an extent with this one constraint, which is 25% of seats held by the military. So in a way, also ironically, the military is going to be the only check and balance on the power, the extraordinary sweeping power of this popular force, which at the moment is to the good. However, I would say that, you know, Aung San Suu Kyi is not young. She's 71 in, um, in 2016. Uh, people said she wasn't in great health, but in fact, looking at uh, the way she did that election campaign, I think she had more energy than a 20-year-old. Uh, how long, I mean, she was clearly running on adrenaline. You could see when you're 
seeing her at campaign rallies and things, there was real fire and she was, you know, this was her, her you know, make or break moment. Uh, whether she can sustain that on a daily basis, because she is uh, a very controlling figure and likes to micromanage things, as we saw in her initial meeting with all her elected MPs uh, this week, where she kind of lectured them on everything, including behaviour, um, how to deal with the constituency, telling them they should collect garbage, they are not above collecting garbage, they must keep their constituencies clean, laying down all kinds of rules. Meanwhile, she's doing the horse trading on the configuration of the new government. I mean, how long a single person can sustain all of that on a daily basis, sort of 18 hours a day, is, you know, really something to think about. She's very determined, she's formidable. But, uh, you know, the NLD is her. She has not uh, cultivated any real deputies, apart from an 89-year-old man, uh, Tinu. So uh, she is surrounded by a fairly um, sort of a finite uh, support system. And meanwhile, there's a lot of very young, eager, bright people in the NLD, very impressive, but they're sort of below 40, a lot of them, and clearly not up to the, the role of kind of being deputies running a government. Well, in fact, there's almost no one in the whole setup that actually has that kind of experience. There's a handful of um, business people, but very few business people, and you know, wanderings, I'm sure my colleagues will back me on this, every NLD candidate I interviewed who won was kind of a retired school teacher, a former political prisoner, a, you know, a grocery store owner. So, um, you know, it's a massive learning curve and unfortunately the country and how it's run is going to be the laboratory for this band of neophytes to take over the, the government. I think her greatest enemy at this point for Aung San Suu Kyi in the entire phase this country is about to go into is, um, is popular expectations. They are so impossibly high. There is actually nowhere to go but down. She cannot possibly address the hopes when you go around the country and interview people, the kind of shining hope, like she's some goddess who's going to make everything okay overnight, is you know daunting, it's scary. I mean, I'd hate to be in her position. People will be disappointed. The big question is, how long will they give her um, before that threshold of disappointment is really reached? I think that it will be quite some time. I think she can last a whole term and people will be understanding. They are so happy to have her there. Um, but there's going to be some you know, mistakes and bitching and moaning and um, things will, will get murky. Anyway, it's, uh, it's useless to play that kind of prediction Gain. But I think the other key questions include, you know, what does happen with prospects of any change to the Constitution? This is her number one issue. So she will stop at nothing. And, you know, there's a lot of speculation, I think not just idle, that uh, she may be prepared to give the military some very significant concessions, including possibly far more. The military is entitled to three seats in Cabinet, um, Defence, Border Affairs and Home uh, inter Interior. And there's some suggestion that she might offer them more of a role in the cabinet in exchange for agreeing to lessen its veto power in uh, parliament over the constitution, uh, changes to the constitution. Uh, any number of other speculations about the kind of deals she might offer the military and how far the military would be prepared to compromise, um, likely depending on her choice. One mustn't forget she made a very, um, odd and improbable close relationship with Shui uh, Man, the, uh, the Speaker of Parliament, in the preceding, you know, in the last couple of years, which became closer and closer and actually it got to the point where she was publicly defending him, um, you know, expressed great displeasure when he was ousted as head of the, uh, acting head of the ruling USDP uh, earlier this year. And uh, he was he ran in the elections and lost. So he's sort of in a on the cusp of a political wilderness there. He's very unpopular in his own USDP party. And anyway, clearly he doesn't want any. I mean, it's not going to get him anywhere to stick with the USDP. So you know, there is a lot of speculation about his future and whether he would join the NLD, in fact, and become like her nominee or play a role in any administration that she would be running. And I wouldn't discount that either. Um, I'll just uh, hurry on here. Uh, um, so one other thing I'd say is that she's got 
several options. What role would Aung San Suu Kyi play um, in this new configuration? I think, you know, one is she could be a power in parliament. She could become speaker of parliament, which was a job five, five years ago that everyone saw as a meaningless job for a rubber stamp body. In fact, to, to Shui Man's credit, he built parliament up as an extremely activist, um, activist body that really took on the president's office and in fact counted its, uh, its power um, very much and defeated the president on many fronts and has actually sort of developed into an extremely robust legislature and in fact from now is actually going to be a real parliament up to now. Uh, let's not forget the election that ushered in this whole new system. Myanmar never had a parliament in, um, in the modern era and uh, this parliament that, that is just having its final session now was a result of the 2010 elections, which was boycotted by the NLD. So it's full of um, retired civil servants, military, retired military um, business interests who were just actually put in, assigned virtually. And this docile, and the election is criticised anyway as not very free or fair. So in fact, you've got a, a parliament that's become very active and, uh, and robust, which actually was made up of fairly compliant regime supporting individuals. This will be the first proper one. So she could do a lot as Speaker of Parliament. However, if she becomes Speaker of Parliament, she can't really do a hands-on role with the government and the cabinet because there is an increasingly big um, Chinese wall between the two, the executive and the legislature. So the other thing she could do is make herself foreign minister. And if she does that, she has every right to be in the cabinet, sit in cabinet meetings, do the international diplomacy thing with her pet president, um, you know, keep a watchful eye on everything, and also be on the all-powerful National Defence and Security Council, which is a bit like a National Security Council body, which can actually um, do many things, including um, decide that uh, there's a state of emergency and therefore, you know, the military can take over the country and all that. So fairly critical body. She can be on it as foreign minister. If she joins the cabinet, though, she has to give up her parliamentary seat. You can't be in the government and retain your parliamentary seat. And in fact, that's one claim to her whole legitimacy as an elected representative of the people. If she gives up her seat, and she's just a minister in the cabinet, it leaves her, it sort of diminishes her stature. So, you know, that's a very big decision she's got to take. And the, the third option is to do nothing and be a shadow shogun with no particular role. But again, she's very vulnerable. Does she turn up to, you know, does she turn up to ASEAN meetings like sort of hovering behind her pet president, um, trying to shake pants along with her president? Or does she sort of sit in a back room pulling strings this is a, a, a real question for her to answer. And uh, for the rest of society, I'd say, you know, the key interest groups that are really going to have a say and want more of a say are not just political parties, but there is that whole sort of community of business, big business, uh, not just cronies, but, you know, who have been increasingly drawn into the system and the daily life of the country and have a lot of impact uh, on many things. The ethnic, um, the ethnic parties who did collapse vote-wise in the election, but are very much a big constituency and a factor she must really deal with. Tied to that is the peace process, which um, been uh, also discussed, and I'm sure um, others will discuss. Um, so many issues there, and uh, I've got a lot of other things to say, but I think I'll just leave it there and uh, open it up to, to Jonathan. Over to you. Thank <laughs> you.